On the chaotic expanse of the internet, there are a lot of opinions. When it comes to adaptations, these opinions tend to get very passionate, especially with books that are adapted to film or television. When I find a book series that really moves me, I develop it in my mind. I've imagined the world, the colors, the tiny behavioral tics in a character's mannerisms. Everyone who reads a story will have slightly different images in their heads. As author John Green has stated in multiple interviews, books belong to their readers. I don't think it matters whether an author intended a symbolic resonance in their story as long as it's there. Because we're not reading the author, we're reading the book. This is what makes literature so beautiful. However, when that story is then adapted to the screen, it is impossible to satisfy every viewer's expectations. This is part of the reason the internet, and especially YouTube, is full of negative opinions. Hot takes about the flaws in a new release, eviscerations of a film trilogy that was given expectations it could not possibly have lived up to, dissections about what went wrong in an adaptation. We care about these stories, and we care about them enough to analyze them so rigorously. Today, I'm going to not do that. Instead, I get to try a different approach, what went right. Spoilers. This video contains spoilers for the whole first season of the Shadow and Bone Netflix series, as well as the books Shadow and Bone, Six of Crows, and Crooked Kingdom. If you want to go consume these first, this is your chance to hop off and come back later. Time to enter the Grishaverse. For an overwhelming amount of high fantasy, the basis of the world tends to be medieval Europe. This is the very first thing the Grishaverse does very differently. Leigh Bardugo did not take her inspiration from medieval Europe, and instead took it from imperial Russia. The country of Shuhan is taken to be similar to East Asia, which is seen in Alina being part Shu and played by a Chinese actress. Compare that to Fierda to the north, which is clearly reminiscent of Russia. This right away makes for a refreshing change of pace for a fantasy world. It also gives the world building more room to grow and change without falling into common fantasy tropes. It really does give the feel of a truly unique world whose rules we don't really have a frame of reference for. A lot of fantasy tends to base itself on a feudal system, and we can infer a fair amount about the world rules from there. The Grishaverse doesn't appear to be a feudal system, so I didn't have that frame of reference that I do for other fantasy worlds. Even further, the Grishaverse contains several countries with drastically different societal systems, leading to more diversity from the jump. When it comes to imagining a world in my mind, I tend to spend a lot of time imagining the actual set. Picturing Sandskiffs broken and abandoned inside the fold, imagining the grime of the barrel in Ketterdam, the show, for the most part, met my expectations, and when it didn't, it had a good reason. I was expecting the palaces, both grand and little, to have lots of big ornate spires similar to what was on the original covers. When I saw the little palace in the show, I was initially disappointed. Then I discovered that the little palace isn't CGI or a man-made set, it's an actual place in Hungary built in the 1800s. More and more movies and shows are being made with increased dependence on CGI. So to see that this show opted to use a real set instead was really exciting for me. Most of the sets were actually real, non-green screen sets. It harkened back to projects like Lord of the Rings, where the CGI was limited and allowed the films to feel very real and grounded. By not making the sets CGI dependent, it actually helped with the fantasy aspect. The only consistently CGI aspects were the stag, the fold, and the Grisha powers. These are supposed to be magical, fantastical elements. They feel more fantastical because the rest of the set is grounded in realism. The costumes in this show are absolutely breathtaking. 
I get tired just imagining the painstaking effort it took to do all the kefta embroidery. I think costumes are sometimes overlooked in film and television. I consider costume design to be just as important as set design. Possibly more important, especially in fantasy. Because while the set design does matter, the first time watching a show, I'm not particularly focused on the set. I'm focused on the characters, so the costumes are truly the first tangible part of world building that I notice. That being said, for all the Kefta's uniformity, the rest of the characters have complete individuality in their costuming. Just look at the three crows. Inez's outfits not only help define her as Suli, but help with her skills as the Wraith and her ability to all but disappear. Kaz's look is one of the more well-defined looks in the books. It's stated that he always wears his gloves. His cane is specifically described in detail. That cane is quite a piece of hardware, Mr. Brecker. Is it fabricator made? It was, in fact, the work of a Grisha fabricator lead-lined, and perfectly weighted for breaking bones. Jesper's outfits fit well with his cool, gunslinging personality. His jackets are awesome, and I want one. I'm excited to see the eventual cosplays from this show, because the costumes give you a lot to choose from. What I found most interesting about this Netflix series is that it's not just covering one book. Most of the plot is focused on the events from Shadow and Bone, but it also includes the cast from Six of Crows. There's a few reasons why this works. One is that the events from Six of Crows happen a few years after the Shadow and Bone trilogy. This allowed the showrunners to take the characters from Six of Crows and incorporate them into the story without compromising the canon timelines. Another reason this works is because Shadow and Bone, the book, is a first-person limited viewpoint. When you're adapting a story with a limited viewpoint, you can either keep the viewpoint of the adaptation limited or expand on the knowledge you give the audience. Now this is something that has clearly been done before. The Hunger Games trilogy was a single first-person narrator. The movies took the opportunity to show more of the world, from the game maker's room during the games to the uprisings throughout the districts. One of the biggest reasons combining these books works is the difference in motivations between the casts. Shadow and Bone is primarily a plot-driven story, whereas Six of Crows is a character-driven story. In short, plot-driven stories focus on the choices the characters make, whereas character-driven stories focus on the reasons that led to those characters' choices. This is evident in the Netflix series. Alina, throughout much of the story, is motivated by external forces. Things happen to her, and her actions are in response to that. Volcra attack her, she releases sunlight. The Darkling kidnaps her to the Little Palace, and she must learn to adjust from there. There are some small changes made in adaptation that actually serve to give Alina more agency in her own story. In the books, she is scheduled to be going across the fold at the very beginning. In the show, she initially wasn't under these orders, which would have split her from Mal. Don't cross him. Well, orders are orders. If it goes wrong, come back. You've lost enough to it already. I'll find my way back to you. Promise. She burned very specific maps needed by the First Army. She knew doing so would require the commander to bring a cartographer along. Now, the event that kicks off the plot, Alina getting attacked by Volkra, was in part caused by her own decisions. Six of Crows is, at its core, a heist story. And while the twists and turns of a heist are exhilarating, they aren't actually the focus of most heist stories. Heist stories can often feel like a type of character study, and the nature of the heist story allows a slightly wider view while still being a type of character study. Take the Ocean movies. 
The heist is fun, and yes, the big reveal at the end of how they pulled it all off is exciting. But the heist itself is not actually what I remember from those movies. Because the plot wasn't actually the focus. It was the characters. Ocean's Eleven focuses around Danny Ocean, his wife Tess, and Terry Benedict. But the films do not just focus on these three. Although Danny is considered the lead character, he is far from the only character focus. Every member of the crew has different motivations and different skill sets to add to the group. Despite their common objective, their individuality is not sacrificed here. The crows are similar in this. The crows in the show choose this job, which they catch wind of in episode 1. However, it is entirely their choice to take the job. They are motivated more by internal factors. Kaz his greed, Inej her want of freedom, Jesper his love of adventure. They could have easily let this job pass them by. They already had plenty of obligations and income sources in Ketterdam. Because the crows were written as the sole focus of the duology, there was more time in the books to truly develop the characters. And the genius of the Netflix show is how precise they were with these characters. They knew the crows only had a limited amount of screen time and a lot of character nuance to fit in. They were able to isolate specific motivations of each crow and display them through acting and film language. It truly brings you into the world, but more importantly, into the characters. The only character thread that I think doesn't work is Nina and Matthias' story. Nina is tangentially mentioned when the crows are in Novokibirsk, but they never actually cross paths. From there, she is captured and spends a majority of the season either on the sea or stranded with Matthias. This is a storyline that is alluded to in Six of Crows that we now get to see played out in more detail. I understand the desire to include Nina and Matthias in this show. They're core characters in Six of Crows. Nina is especially beloved by many for being a good representation of a fat character, something that is often not portrayed well in the fantasy genre. There's a pub downstairs that serves hot meals. Maybe they have waffles. What are waffles? I can't wait to introduce you to my truest Hello. Is there meat in this? Mm, no. Saints, you're a genius. Yeah. Infused with cured boar. Is this supposed to be sweet or savory? Yes. As the show goes on, these internal or external motivations do begin to shift. The crows hit obstacles in their quests and have to adapt. After their initial decision to take the quest, a lot of their actions are motivated externally by a need to get to the reward at the end of the rainbow. Alina accepts her calling to the stag and decides to stand up to the Darkling in the end. Speaking of the Darkling, can we talk about him for a minute? I love the Darkling. Not in the way fan fiction sites love the Darkling. I love the Darkling because he is a fantastically written villain. This is essential for me. A world can be as captivating as possible, but without a strong villain, I will often struggle to keep my ADD brain focused on the story. This is why it took me so much longer to read Six of Crows. There's not really a big bad for them to go fight. Fine. Make me your villain. So the Darkling cinched my immersion into the Grishaverse. When I think of well-written villains, my mind inevitably goes to Cersei Lannister from Game of Thrones. She was an extremely compelling villain, not only because she did horrific things, but because of her really strong, rock-solid motivations. Her moral compass is not one that I can align with whatsoever, but she never really wavered from it. Oh, but it was. When you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. There is no middle ground. Her goal was to protect her family, more specifically Jamie and their children, 
As long as her actions were in service of that, she was able to justify some truly horrific acts, including blowing up the world equivalent of the Vatican. Lena Headley did an amazing job as Cersei. She really gives you insight into Cersei's thoughts. Ben Barnes does similarly well as the Darkling. Rewatching it, I notice very minute facial expressions that really, in hindsight, give away the Darkling's response. But these tiny behavioral tics aren't so pronounced as to give away the game the first time watching. A great example of this comes in episode 5. Alina is coming to trust Kerrigan more. She stands close to him, pausing just long enough to allude to interest. You can almost see it click in his brain that he can charm her, he can seduce her. Up until that point, it was never anything he came even close to trying. In episode 4, he tried to win her trust by revealing some of his, quote, tragic backstory. When I was a boy, I used to run away and hide here. Once I realized that I was a descendant of the most hated Grisha in Ravka. I'd come here, throw a coin, make a wish in the fountain. Same wish, over and over again. That I could be anyone else. This is actually a fairly common technique among abusers. They will share a part of their traumatic past as a way for you to relate to them and trust them more. The speech and behavior of Kerrigan in this scene shows that this is a tactic he has likely used before to much success. It's rehearsed. This, in a way, makes the ballroom interlude scene more compelling, because now you see him switching tactics as he goes. He was looking for another way in, sensing that the traumatic backstory didn't gain him the full devotion he was aiming for. Once he saw that cue from Alina, you can see how he immediately switches tactics. And it works. I think it's really the first time you see the man smile in the entire show, and it was in service of a con. Ben Barnes just did such an amazing job with this role, capturing the austerity of the Darkling as well as the machinations behind his facade. You can see him plotting, but unless you already know, you can't see what he's plotting. This becomes evident with the destruction of Novakirbirsk. In the book, I had no idea what was going to happen. I was screaming at my book in shock and horror. Which, I love third act twists. If done correctly, they're some of the most exciting moments in an entire series, and Lee Bardugo is great at writing these. The show does give you a few more hints as to what is about to happen. It's evident that the Dark Lane is planning something. It's hinted at even more with Zoya. She brings up the fact that her family lives in Novakibirsk and is told to stop the skiff before the Western Dry Docks. See? Some girl's not so useless. Whatever gets us to Novakibirsk. As soon as we land, I'm going straight to see my aunt. You have family there? Yes, my family's Rubkin. That's why I volunteer to drive the skiffs to see them. The show gives us more detail into his story when he created the fold. And I think this almost adds to the intrigue in a way. Because the characterization between the Black Heretic and General Kirgan are so drastically different that I find myself wanting more. How did he go from creating the fold to leading the second army? When did he decide that the best way to save Ravka was destroying more of it? What I'm saying is the Darkling is a well-written, very nuanced character, allowing me to rewatch the show multiple times and still feel compelled by him. A lot of this video will be about representation. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the representation, both in the books and in the show. The reason these characters all stand out as complex, fully formed individuals is, well, because they are. Because there's a lot of representation here, and it is fantastic. Warning. This section covers discussion of violence against East and Southeast Asian populations. If you need to skip this section, click to the next chapter.
Six of Crows was written with good racial diversity. Jesper is explicitly described as black. Inej is Suli and is described as having brown skin and long dark hair. In the show, she is played by Amita Suman, a Nepali-born actress and one of my favorite casting choices. Although racism against Inej is not a focus of the show, they do manage to still show an example of racial insensitivity. I didn't know that Emily had such talent. She's Suli. The biggest change in representation through adaptation was actually adding more diversity to the cast. Alina and Mal are both white in the books. In the show, they are both mixed race. One of the first things Alina talks about in narration is how she looks like her mother and that makes others view her differently. I live in East Ravka, but I've never been welcome here because I look like my mother and she looked like the enemy. I mentioned earlier that in the Grishaverse, Shuhan on Ravka's southern border is intended to represent East and Southeast Asia, or ESEA. Alina is played by Jessie Mei Li, a Chinese-English actress. This show was very timely released, only five weeks after the spa shootings in Atlanta that led to the deaths of eight people, six of whom were Asian women. However, this was just the latest in a long, brutal history of the racism Asian populations have experienced all over the world. If you've seen any speeches that Tangerine Palpatine made in 2020, you've heard some of the cruel names for COVID-19 that have inflamed anti-Asian sentiment. And that effect did not stay within U.S. borders. In the first quarter of 2020, UK police data suggests a rise of 300% in hate crimes towards ESEA populations. COVID-19 is far from the first time Asian populations have been scapegoats for disease or other societal problems. In the 19th century, Chinese immigrants were perceived to be sources of diseases like smallpox, leprosy, and malaria. These unfounded fears fueled the U.S. to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. In 1900, an outbreak of the bubonic plague in San Francisco led to the segregation of the city's Chinatown. Russell Jean, a professor at San Francisco State University, explained, The actual neighborhood was roped off some, barbed wire put up, and that's their approach to dealing with disease. But often, the racism Asian people experience on a daily basis is less overt. The Asian-Australian Alliance found that of the more than 500 incidences of COVID-19-related racism between April 2020 and March 2021, 40% were casual racist slurs. The casual racism against AAPI is so prevalent, it's trickled down to younger generations. I remember as a young school child seeing kids pull their eyes up to make slanted eyes. I didn't even learn how horribly careless and racist that is until many years later. This racism around eye shape is addressed within the Shadow and Bone series. This velvet. I'd start by making her eyes not shoot, Miss Seffen. I don't pick my stuff. The queen assigns them, mostly so she can spy on me. Don't change my eyes. This scene does two very good things. It exemplifies the everyday racism Asians have to face, and it shows Alina choosing not to change herself to satisfy what bigots feel she needs to fix. And it's not the only time that casual racism is addressed in the show. What's a shoe girl doing here? I'm Ravkin on the cartography team. She's off shoe. An orphan. Is that an answer? Back of the lane. Choosing to change Alina to half shoe and the choice to employ an actress of Chinese heritage were both incredibly good ideas on the part of the show. It adds another dynamic to the character. It is now not a certainty that everyone in Ravka will accept her as the sun summoner because she does not fit into the idea they had imagined. And it adds another element for Alina and Mal to bond over as children. Now, let's talk about Mal for a minute. 
His ethnicity is not explicitly stated, but it is heavily implied that he is also half Shoe. He is mocked by the other orphans at Karemzin. I bet his worm's there. Well, you run from me, half breeds. Stay away from him. Oh, what? You're gonna draw me where I see her. However, from what we see in the show, Older Mal does not seem to suffer the same casual racism that Alina does. This is most likely because Mal passes as Ravkin. Passing as a different race is a complicated issue in our society. Some minorities, especially those of mixed race, can pass as white, giving them some of the privilege that white people are born with. The concept of passing has been gaining attention in the media and among sociologists who are using the phenomenon to highlight issues surrounding privilege. The concept of passing has also highlighted the topic of colorism. Colorism is prejudice or discrimination against individuals with a darker skin tone, typically among people of the same ethnic or racial group. This is often talked about with black communities, but also affects Asian people as well. Whiteness in many places is associated with higher, more affluent classes. This is inextricably aligned with systemic racism and white privilege. The definition of passing has been broadening over the last few decades, encompassing more minorities. LGBTQ plus folks can often experience this, passing as cis het, even if they're not. I tend to get nervous when any fictional world adds queer representation, especially in high fantasy. Because so many high fantasy worlds are based on medieval Europe, the treatment of queer characters goes anywhere from being told to keep it behind closed doors, to being imprisoned, to being outright tortured or murdered. But as we've established, the Greece reverse is different in many aspects. So we get good queer representation. Yvonne and Fedor are given larger roles in the show than they have in the books. As part of this character expansion, we learn that Yvonne and Fedor are in a relationship. I found this heartwarming, especially when you compare the characters side by side. They are both heart renders, but their personalities are drastically different. My fault, I insisted. I'm sorry. I was just trying my one impression. How did I do? A little too convincing. Often in television, if a gay couple is shown, they somehow both seem to fit quite neatly into gay stereotypes. Showing a relationship between two men of such different demeanors sort of flies in the face of that, demonstrating using very little screen time that not everyone in a marginalized community is the same. Jesper is one of my favorite things about this show, period. He carries the burden of most of the comic relief throughout the series. His jovial, laid-back nature lends to his ability to con people, and in the process of that con, we get actual concrete confirmation of his not being straight. It's one aspect of his character, but it's not his whole character. Some sources list Jesper as bisexual and, in true Hollywood fashion, that fact seems to be erased in the show. Bisexual erasure or bisexual invisibility is a pervasive problem in which the existence or legitimacy of bisexuality is questioned or denied outright. It's a problem that can lead to discrimination against bisexuals, including the common misconception that bisexuals are just confused or bisexuals aren't real. So Jesper, as currently portrayed, is gay. If the showrunners and Lee Bardugo consider Jesper bi, I hope they give us explicit facts to back that up in subsequent seasons. But until then, I can happily say that Jesper being gay is a very positive example of LGBTQ plus representation in television. Disability and neurodivergence are always in need of good, honest representation. In both literature and Hollywood, there is a culture of shying away from these traits, and when they are included, they are often reduced to harsh, generally untrue stereotypes. Two of the main tropes are to either 
make the disabled character an object of scorn, often in making the villain disabled in some way, or give the disabled character superpowers, essentially rendering their disability obsolete. The Grishaverse seems to have actually threaded the line and created real, complete characters with disabilities. And more importantly, disabled characters who don't have disabled as their main character trait. The obvious first character to come to mind is Kaz Brecker. That really cool cane is not just for dramatic effect. Kaz has a noticeable limp. Now I... I don't like Kaz. I just don't. I didn't like him when I read the books, didn't like him in the show. I can't really articulate why I don't like Kaz. I just don't like him, like, as a person. That being said, the portrayal of Kaz's disability is phenomenally done. Kudos to Freddie Carter for this performance. It was completely believable. I honestly forgot several times that the actor does not have a limp because he was just that consistent. It's not explained what gave Kaz his limp because it doesn't need to be explained. Lee Bardugo herself is disabled with a limp. She has stated in interviews that Kaz was her focus inspiration when first starting to write Six of Crows. Kaz being disabled does not automatically require giving the audience a backstory to justify the disability. And at this point in the timeline, a backstory for Kaz would actively harm his characterization. He is mysterious, withdrawn, and a calculating leader. He doesn't need or want pity. In Crooked Kingdom, Kaz is speaking to Wylan and says, when people see a cripple walking down the street, leaning on his cane, what do they feel? Wylan looked away. People always did when Kaz talked about his limp, as if he didn't know what he was or how the world saw him. They feel pity. Now, what do they think when they see me coming? Wylan's mouth quirked up at the corner. They think they'd better cross the street. You're not weak because you can't read. You're weak because you're afraid of people seeing your weakness. You're letting shame decide who you are. But this does not render his limp obsolete. In the Little Palace, Kaz at one point impersonates a guard. You can see the effort he uses to not show his limp without his cane. And you can see the toll it takes on him. His disability is not seen as heroic or monstrous. Instead, it's seen as just another part of Kaz as a character. I do need to preface the rest of this section. Throughout this section, I will be talking about mental illness and neurological conditions, specifically attention disorders and autism. Lee Bardugo has stated in interviews that the Grishaverse has no words for these diagnoses and therefore she will not state outright whether or not a character has a given condition. That being said, some of these characters exhibit several hallmark symptoms or behaviors associated with either autism or ADHD. Many readers who share these conditions have voiced that they recognize themselves in these characters and consider these characters examples of representation. So although the actual words autism or attention disorders aren't explicit in the show, I will still be analyzing these characters as examples of representation. Mental illness in film or television often falls into its own tropes and stereotypes. Jasper's neurodivergence, as seen in the show, is honestly not something I noticed initially. And that probably has more to do with me having similar illnesses and having those behaviors as a part of my everyday life. Jesper exhibits many of the characteristics indicative of ADHD. Attention disorders are often poorly portrayed in the media. I see a lot of assumptions about crazed hyper kids who are just incapable of control. I personally call this the Tigger effect. I guess you could also call it the Doug dilemma. Squirrel. However, Jesper shows more of what it's like to live as an adult with attention disorders. You may have better outward control, but it's not a condition that you can outgrow. I saw a lot of behaviors in Jesper that I myself exhibit on a regular basis. <sighs> Jesper, not even paying attention, are you? 
I'm sorry, what now? I said you're not paying attention. Oh, I do vaguely remember you being airborne. Was that recently? It's not just in isolated incidences that we see Jesper's ADHD. Throughout the show, he exhibits many common symptoms. Because getting distracted isn't the whole of what it's like to live with an attention disorder. Jesper is almost always fidgeting, often with his gun, which seems like a super safe idea. When we first meet Jesper, we learn that he was supposed to be manning the door and most likely got distracted by the busyness inside. Even more noticeable is that Jesper does not handle boredom well. Now, this is true to some extent for all humans, but is especially pronounced with ADHD. It's what can lead to a lot of the fidgeting as well as moments like this. Without a task to focus on, Jesper starts doing other things to keep himself occupied. Many people with attention disorders find that keeping their hands busy by fidgeting with something can actually help them focus on what they should be. We see this with Milo the goat. The conductor by this point has most likely noticed Jesper's ADHD. Knowing that he'd need Jesper to sit still on the train, he figured out something that would help Jesper accomplish that giving him a goat to hold and fuss over. He even says as much. I never make you with this extra weight. Give me a second. This is how we die. Jasper, grab the goat. I'm not throwing out the goat. Grab the damn goat. Oh. It's not bait. It's for you. I need you to calm down. Hug the goat. Shut the hell up. Another common trait of ADHD is executive dysfunction, which can include problems with focusing, remembering, or planning. We see this in how Jesper does not make plans himself, instead relying on Kaz to do it. One other thing that executive dysfunction can cause is impulsivity. Jesper highlights a very prevalent fact about ADHD, and that is the correlation with addiction. Jesper has a gambling addiction, and that fact is not hidden from us. This correlation between the two becomes obvious in this scene in Novokibirsk. Jesper, just the call, no detours. <laughs> Alabaster coal. No way. Eleven. ADHD and addiction of all types have always had a strong correlation. Both exhibit many of the same symptoms such as impulsivity and executive dysfunction. According to a 2020 article in the Journal of Attention Disorders, close to 20% of those with gambling disorder also test positive for ADHD symptoms. I really enjoyed how the show handles both this intersection and Jesper's ADHD in general. Kit Young does a great job of exhibiting what it's like when the disorder isn't new to the person. It's clear Jesper has accepted that this is who he is and he's just gonna roll with it. David is a fabricator who doesn't really start showing up in the story until the second half of the season. Again, the word autism does not exist in Ravka, but many autistic fans consider David to be autistic. Autism in television has very rarely been portrayed well. There's a tendency in the industry to focus on verbal, higher skilled characters towards the savant end of the spectrum. They make for interesting characters to be sure, but they have left most people with a very narrow view of what autism is. David shows many of the characteristics associated with autism. Many autistic folks struggle to make or maintain eye contact, something we see consistently from David. He has also seen missing social cues. His awkwardness with Jenya, which is more obvious in the books, most likely stems from his inability to figure out how to handle the situation. In the book Shadow and Bone, it is also shown that David usually works alone. I find David's place within the story intriguing, because David, in both show and books, is treated differently than I've seen from other autistic characters. The basis in this is how David is accepted by others he interacts with. Spoilers. To avoid spoilers for the rest of the Shadow and Bone trilogy, I'm not going to expand too much on David here, 
I do want to point out one specific interaction, though. It's a waste of time. She's not with them. She's on her own. And our priority now is to locate her as quickly as possible. You don't need to put... Yes, David. Well, Jen, you gave her a ring. Made of pure iridium, not native to Ravka. So when we get within one mile of her, I can direct us. Kiergan noticed the behavior, but stopped himself from correcting it. Maybe because he was just impatient and didn't want to waste the time to correct David. Or maybe because he realized it is David he's talking to. Because truly accepting autistic people, or really any disabled person, means accepting those behaviors and or limitations too. And assuming this show gets renewed for more seasons, there is more diversity coming down the pike. Wylin, first introduced in Six of Crows, is dyslexic and functionally cannot read. He's a great example of invisible disabilities and I cannot wait to see him in the show. All the disability representation in the Grishaverse has one running theme, acceptance. In our world, there is a tendency for the media to make stories of disabled people into what we call inspiration porn, glossing over the day-to-day -day realities of being disabled. The Grishaverse does not do this. It shows disabilities honestly, both the good and the bad. And these disabled characters are fully accepted by the others around them. Because the burden shouldn't be on the disabled person to change to match everyone else. The burden should be on everyone else to work with and accommodate those limitations. Shadow and Bone was written right as Lee Bardugo was starting out as an author. The prospect of creating a whole new world is daunting. Because of that, a lot of authors' early projects tend to fall back on what the author knows. In an interview with Polygon, Bardugo states, I was really echoing a lot of the fantasies I'd grown up with, which were very white, very straight, sort of traditional chosen one stories. Creator Eric Heiserer approached the project with the intent to change some things from the books with a focus on diversity, both in the cast and crew. Lee Bardugo was also very on board with this, wanting the show to, quote, do this better than I did. How much creative control should an author have? I can't talk about creative control without talking about she who must not be named Queen of the Turfs. J.K. Rowling is a tyrant when it comes to creative control, always demanding as much control as possible, even when the project in question is something that she clearly does not have the skill to do. This is really evident in the Fantastic Beasts movies, where she was given a lot of latitude in the screenwriting, which was bad. Because she's not a screenwriter, but she co-wrote Fantastic Beasts. It really, ugh, it hurts. Contrast that with the Hunger Games movies. In the first movie, author Suzanne Collins was one of the screenwriters. This worked out pretty well because she knew she was not a screenwriter. She's a novelist, and those are very different mediums. She was able to bring to the script something new in that she was able to expand the world. I stated before that The Hunger Games is written from a single, first-person viewpoint. Collins was brought on to expand on the world she had in her mind, but couldn't express before because she was limited by her POV. This is similar to what Lee Bardugo does. She's not listed as a screenwriter, but it's clear that she did have a fair amount of input into expanding the world and adding aspects outside Alina's POV. Shadow and Bone, in essence, has all of the great hallmarks of a fantastic, long-running fantasy series. Detailed world-building, relatable characters, nuanced and enthralling villain. But it has enough differences from the usual tropes of the fantasy genre to make it a whole new experience. I think this show has a really important point to make about the industry as a whole, and that is that you can have fantasy worlds based on days of old, based on time periods well gone by, but you can still change these fantasy worlds to keep up with today's society. You see this in the extreme focus they took to increase diversity here.
This is still a very immersive fantasy world, but has more diversity than its predecessors. The Grishaverse should serve as a lesson to other fantasy writers and other fantasy TV shows. You don't have to be stuck in the past when you make your story. This is proof that fantasy as a genre can adapt and it can keep pace with our ever-changing society. I forgot to mention, Mal in the TV show is nearly indestructible, to the point that my friends and I have started calling him a human pincushion.